I'm thrilled to have time with you today to delve into Jeremiah. And um, when we talk about Jeremiah, we're talking about different things. We could be talking about Jeremiah the book. So I wanna start there. Jeremiah as a book is the second of the major prophets after Isaiah in the Jewish Tanakh, um, in the Jewish Torah. Um, but the location is not necessarily static. Um, in the Babylonian Talmud, uh, edited 200 to 500 CE in Baba Batra, um, that text suggests that Jeremiah should actually come before Isaiah, which some of you studied um, with Rabbi Bernstein over the past two weeks. Um, and that source also tells us that Jeremiah not only wrote this book, the book of Jeremiah, but also the book of Kings and Lamentations. So um, also in the Septuagint, there is yet another order where Jeremiah comes after the minor prophets and Isaiah. And there's a shorter version of Jeremiah, not the 52 chapters we have in our version that has also been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Qumran texts. So Jeremiah as a book is a unit that has some dynamism in itself. What we're really going to be focusing on is Jeremiah as a prophet. Um, over the next two sessions, we'll be doing Jeremiah this week and next week. And we're going to be looking at his role as a prophet, the great contemporary translator and commentator on the Torah, Robert Alter, said of all the prophets, Jeremiah is the one who conveys to us the most vivid sense of the man behind the words. Of all the prophets, this is the most autobiographical book. The one where we actually see the most about the prophet, how the prophecy affected his life and what happened in his life. And so today we're going to be focusing at the beginning really on the first chapter. The first chapter in many ways introduces tensions that we'll see throughout the book. So we're going to do a close reading of the very beginning of it. And next time we'll definitely look at the very end. And then whatever we get to, we're going to be sort of picking um, from pieces in the middle thematically um, and all of this to say, there is no way in two one hour sessions, we're going to get to cover the glory that is Jeremiah. And so I hope this will at the very least pique your interest into looking um, more at the rest of the text. Okay, so what is it that you know about Jeremiah? Just from, you know, whether you've studied or before or not, feel free in the chat. What are your associations with the prophet Jeremiah? Is there anything you know about him just from pop culture or from, from your own associations? I'll give you a minute. Reluctant. Doom and gloom, woe is me. Yes, all of these things. <laughs> oh, that he was imprisoned, that he is a Kohen um, and lives in Benjaminite territory and a yoke. Jeremiah is known um, as, as just being a devastating prophet, right? Um, the, the doom and gloom um, is definitely correct. He's known as, as bringing bad news. Um, and the very word Jeremiah in the OAD is defined as a complaining tirade. A complaining tirade, right? I see King and people didn't want to hear what he had to say, right? No, nobody wanted to hear what he had to say. He had no... 
it, it's not true that he had no good news. We will see mostly next time that he also, like Isaiah, brought some consolation. But what he's known for and what is preponderant in his writings is a sense that destruction and disaster is near. And really, who wants to hear that? Who wants to hear that catastrophe is coming, right? So um, I'm going to, as we move forward, I saw many other things in the chat that we will also be covering. Um, Baruch Bednaria, his scribe, um, and the fact that his writings got burned. We'll be talking about that next week. But again, I want to really do a close reading at the beginning of Jeremiah 1.1. 1, 1. Um, so the very beginning of the book. And just see that in the first chapter, we're going to have context set. We're going to see the call of the prophet and his commission or mission what he's here to do. We're going to get context, call, and commission. All right, and I'll share my screen um, as we look at this. A note on questions. I believe Julie's gonna be closing the chat um, to everyone, but um, I am going to stop just for questions a few times. Um, it is definitely not my nature as a teacher, but I'm going to err on the side of covering more of Jeremiah um, and less discussion. And if you have thoughts or feelings about that, you can also put that in the chat for later and I'll, I'll take a look at it. All right, so um, Jeremiah 1.1, 1, 1. you should be seeing it in just a moment. Let's see, all right. So I gave you the Hebrew and the English of just the beginning. And I wanna go word for word um, with this just for a moment. Okay. Divrei Yirmiyahu, the very first words of the book are the words of Jeremiah. Now this might seem completely natural, but it's actually quite unusual because usually there is an idea that these are the words of God. And here, we're hearing that they're the words of Jeremiah, right? Um, this does happen in other places, uh, specifically Amos, Amos. Um, and with Isaiah, the first words are Chazon Yeshiahu, the vision of Isaiah. But here, I think that the fact that the book begins, by the way, it also ends this way. Divrei Yirmiyahu, um, in its, we'll talk about this next week, but in its first ending at the end of chapter 51. Um, Divrei Yirmiyahu puts a focus right at the beginning on the mediation of communication, the medium of words, the medium of speech we start right away with a focus on the primacy of words and language and a focus on the personhood and the personality of the prophet. Who is Yirmiyahu? His name literally means um, from the words Yarim Ya, may the Lord lift up, may God lift up. Right, so these are the words or the speech of the one that may God lift up. He is Ben Chilkiyahu, the son of Chilkiah, who, by the way, Chilkiah is a high priest at the time, but it's not the son of the high priest. It's a different Chilkiah. Min Hakoanim, from the priestly class, from he's a priest. Now, I just wanted to introduce that this is actually um, an interesting bit of information because we're used to having prophets and we're used to having priests, but there's often a tremendous amount of tension 
between prophets and priests. They are often um, concentrating on very different things and even uh, criticizing one another. For those of you who remember from the Isaiah class, for example, Isaiah's beautiful critique that we read during um, Yom Kippur, um, what is the fast that, is this the fast that I desired, right? There's a critique of pure ritual without um, any application to the community and social justice. Priests and prophets are often clashing, but here in the person of Jeremiah, we have both prophet and priest. He lives asher ba'anatot in the place of Anatot, which is a Benjamite village, about four miles northeast of Jerusalem. It's on the edge of the desert, which influences his choice of imagery in the book. And nearby to this day, there is an Arab city called Anata, and there is archaeological evidence uh, for this city of Anatot. Be'eretz Binyamin, in the region uh, of uh, Benjamin. Okay, I'm going to keep going into our second verse. Asher hayad devar Hashem elav, to whom the word of God came. Okay, again, with our focus on the mediation of how the word works, we're going to be seeing this in other ways. But now we're seeing that the word came to him. Bimei Yoshiahu in the days of Josiah, Ben Amon, the son of Amon, Melech Yehuda, who is the king of Judah, Bishlosh Esresha Nalemelcho, in the 13th year, 13th year of his reign. So a quick um, moment of history here, right? Where are we in time? Um, the 13th year, of Yeshiahu would be around 627 before the Common Era. And um, at this time, when uh, Josiah is king of Judah, um, it's already been a century since the kingdom of Israel has fallen and the large majority of the population of Israel has scattered. This is the losing of the 10 tribes. And so Israel, which was to the north, has already fallen to the Assyrians. And Judah, this kingdom, is now besieged, uh, whether actively or not actively, from really all sides. And so it's a very fraught, fraught moment. Okay, um, a lot more to say here, um, but I'm going to pause for some questions at this point. So if you have a question, go ahead and um, throw it in the chat for now. or you can raise your hand and someone will call on you. Let's see. All right. We have a comment from Rabbi Fire. Thank you for that. Um, Oh, I see a question. Um, yes, Jay. Uh, can someone un unmute Jay Yair Broadbar? Yeah. Okay, here we are. Sorry. Um, so you. Oh, you're muted again, Jay. Okay. Am I okay now? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry. Your emphasis on. on uh, Dalit Beit Resh uh, on, is there an also could be in terms of the importance of words connected to Aseret Hadid Dibrot too? 
Well, look, the, 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 the question about words and, you know, I see Rabbi Fire said, divrei can note, denote matters. These are the matters, the events of Jeremiah. For sure, that's true. Um, what we're going to be seeing in Jeremiah is um, how he delivers the message in different contexts is going to be very important. Whether that's in the imagery, which we're going to see momentarily, or in the actual um, physical form, which we'll see later with scrolls and contracts and deeds, how the prophecy is embodied. Because look, the thing where I think it's not just matters, right? But actually the words or the speech of the prophet, what matters with the prophet, if you look through the different prophets, in many ways, they have very similar messages, right? Follow God, stop following the other, you know, non-gods, you are doing things poorly, do better, right? Their, their messages are not shockingly different from one another, but what is different is the way they get their message across. One question about the Navi, right, which some believe comes from the same root as heavy to bring, how do you successfully bring the message of God to the people, especially when it's something they don't want to hear? You know, we can, we can reflect on this in our own lives, right? We can know something intellectually many different ways, but how does it actually get into us? How do we internalize it? How does it become a truth which might actually transform not just our thinking, but our behavior in the world? This is the challenge for a prophet. And the main tool they have is their words. And what I'm going to suggest is that God in this chapter, in this next section that we're going to see, is actually giving like a class to Jeremiah in how to be a prophet and what he's going to need to do. So maybe we'll, we'll move on. We'll hold off on more questions from, from now on. And uh, just a, um, a note, I'm going to move on to verse four, but I'm going to just read in the English now a whole section. So I'll share my screen again, um, and I'll only be reading, um, let's see. Um, I'll be reading from verse four, just in the English for now. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I fashioned you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came out of the womb, I consecrated you. A prophet to the nations, I made you. And I said, alas, O master, Lord, for look, I know not how to speak, for I am but a lad. And the Lord said to me, do not say I am but a lad, for wherever I send you, you shall go to. And whatever I charge you, you shall speak. Do not fear them, for I am with you to save you, said the Lord. And the Lord reached out their hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, look, I have put words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over nations and over kingdoms to uproot and to smash and to destroy and to lay waste, to build and to plant. Okay, that's a lot. I'm gonna stop there for a minute. The, the class on instruction on being a prophet, prophet isn't over yet, but I don't want to, to get too far ahead of ourselves. So in this, we're seeing the call to Jeremiah when he receives his call as a prophet, which in some ways um, is happening in that moment. But the first thing that God says to Jeremiah 
is before you even came to be, I knew you, right? Before you even came into existence, I already shaped you for this purpose. And Jeremiah's response, as, as many have noted, is not an unusual one in the world of the prophets. It's like, oh no, choose someone else, right? Who does this remind you of, right? We're in, in Exodus, in the, the liturg in, the, in the Torah reading cycle, right? Moses, we're so used to, to the scene at the burning bush where Moses says, pick somebody else, not me, right? And if this sounds familiar, we, should, we, can, we can actually know that in the call to a prophet in the Torah, this is actually part of a type scene, what we're seeing here. In the Torah, there are usually four different phases that we see often with prophets. The commission, God saying, you're gonna be my prophet. The objection, no, no, not me, right? I'm just a lad or something's wrong with my mouth right? Reassurance. No, no, I'm going to be with you. I'll put the words in your mouth, right? And then a sign. And this is true, certainly with Moses, also with Gideon. Um, but here as well, all of these work through, right? We also see with Jonah, his refusal to, um, to want to be a prophet. As we're going to see um, further into our texts today, there's a reason for this. Being a prophet is, is very difficult work. And for Jeremiah, it brings him tremendous suffering, tremendous, tremendous suffering. Um, as Rabbi Bernstein talked about um, in previous classes, um, Rabbi um, Yochanan Mufs, Dr. Mufs of Blessed Memory, talks about the prophet as holding a unique um, role, and that is to stand in the breach. Standing in the breach means standing in a difficult place, a place of mediation between the divine and the people. And so the prophet has to both be open to the words of the divine, to bring them to the people, but also to represent the needs of the people back to the divine. Again, you can think of Moses, right? Or Abraham, famously for fighting back with God saying, but what about the innocent people, right? or don't destroy them, right? It's as much a role of the prophet to speak back to God as it is to speak the words of God to, um, to the people. And so again, the prophet is standing in the breach in the between and it's difficult work. So God says, to Jeremiah, I'm going to put the words in your mouth. And then I'm going to share my screen again, looking at, um, let's see, it always takes me a second to find it. Here we go. Um, looking at that verse 10, where the commission becomes clear, I have appointed you, see, first of all, re see, look, I have appointed you this day over nations and over kingdoms to uproot and to smash and to destroy and to lay waste, to build and to plant. Now, a quick survey of these verbs, right? Shows us that there are more verbs, right? That are about destruction and catastrophe 
And then only after that is the building and the planting. And this is why he is our prophet of, of doom and gloom, right? Because at this point, the people of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, have acted in such a way that the consequences are already catching up with them. There's very little here about doing tshuva now in a, in, in a communal sense to avert the decree. So one of our questions is going to be, so why is he prophesying? If, if it's not for what we normally think of, turn, turn back from these actions so that this bad thing won't happen. I'm just gonna leave this question up for a minute. Why is he saying all of these things? Why is he telling people that disaster will be coming? He's been appointed to uproot, to smash, to destroy, and to lay waste, to know that's coming, and to say it to people, exactly what they don't want to hear, and then to build and to plant. And looking at the first word of verse 10, C, brings us into the whole next section, where sight is essential. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. And the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am vigilant with my word to do it. A quick note on, uh, on the word shakade here the, for almond tree. Uh, we're just... We're just, you know, hours away, a day, a day and a half away, at least in Pacific time, from Tubishvat, right? And Hashkedia Polachat, right? The uh, the almond tree blossoming, right? So the shakade, the branch of an almond tree here, um, shakade is here a pun, because in the next verse, God says, that almond tree, Shkedia, um, Makel Shaked, the branch of the almond, is actually Shoked. It's telling you that I am vigilant, Shoked, with alacrity. I will do what I said, right? And so uh, an image is letting him know what's going to be happening. God is teaching Jeremiah, think in images, understand the message in an image. And if that wasn't enough, in the next verse, he says, and the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, a seething pot I see, and it is turned to the north. So he sees this basically boiling pot, a huge pot that's boiling and, the, and it's turned facing the north. And what does that image mean? And the Lord said to me, from the north shall disaster break loose upon all the inhabitants of the land. For I'm summoning all the people of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord. They shall come and each shall set up a throne before the gates of Jerusalem against its walls round about, against all the towns of Judah. And I will speak out against them for all their wickedness. They have forsaken me and sacrificed to other gods and worshiped the works of their hands. As for you, you shall gird your loins and rise and speak to them all that I charge you. Do not be broken spirited before them, lest I break you before them. I have made you this day a fortress town and an iron pillar and walls of bronze against all the land, against Judah's kings and officers, against its priests and the people of the land, and they will battle against you, but shall not prevail over you. For I am with you, said the Lord, to save you. Just a note again, to see 
What a terrible role Jeremiah has foisted upon him. And how God recognizes that this role God is offering Jeremiah could break his spirit and that it requires God's fortification in order to be what? Against and against and against everyone. All battling against him, but not prevailing over him because of God's presence. And interestingly enough, again, at the end of this sentence, for I am with you, lecha, to save you. Jeremiah is the one here being saved in this piece. All right, I'll stop for uh, if anyone has some questions or comments they want to throw in. Was this book written before or after the Babylonian conquest before? Um, it, at the end, it's during. We actually see, but the first one. So uh, the destruction in 586 BCE is part of what Jeremiah um, witnesses. Yes, Yael has a hand up. I have a question now about... Um... God can harden Pharaoh's heart. Have any of the Rabbanim ever reflected on God's unwillingness to change our behavior instead of destroying us completely? Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think that's such an, an important theological question, when, especially when we read Jeremiah, right? Because unlike so many of the other prophets where there seems to be a sense of you can still change the way this goes, that's not present. And actually, uh, Dr. Yochanan Muffs, when he discusses Jeremiah, he says this is specifically why Jeremiah, more than any other prophet, suffers. Because unlike the other prophets who bring the case of the people to God, exactly as you're asking, to say, wait, can't we make this different? More than once, God tells Jeremiah, you can't. You can't do this. So I'm, I'm going to give you two examples. They're not on your source sheet. But in chapter 7, verse 16, God says, as for you, do not pray for this people. Do not raise a cry of prayer on their behalf. Do not plead with me, for I will not listen to you. There's something that has already been set in motion. This is going to happen. This needs to happen. And we have God saying to the prophet whose role is to pray for the people who, who, whose body desires to get this release of saying, stop, don't. You can't. You can't pray for the people. Similarly, chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. And the Lord said to me, do not pray for the benefit of this people. When they fast, I will not listen to their outcry. And when they present burnt offering and meal offering, I will not accept them. I will exterminate them by war, famine, and disease. This is incredibly troubling. Incredibly troubling. I want to, you know, since this question came up, I just want to go to, um, I'm going to skip over chapter two for a minute and go to, um, to chapter 20, uh, which is, I think I gave that to you. Did I not? Yes. So um, I'll share my screen in just a moment. Um, sorry about this. Here we go. 
Okay. So we're looking at the bottom um, of the second page of the source sheet, Jeremiah, and I'm going to skip ahead. The I'm going to just let you know what's happening. Um, at the beginning of chapter 20, Jeremiah is prophesying the destruction um, of the kingdom. And the chief official in the house of God strikes Jeremiah. There are different ideas of what's actually happening, whether he's being flogged, whether he's being beat up, right? He's getting physically beaten up with violence for his prophecy, and he's um, jailed. And the next day he gets out and he keeps prophesying. And he basically tells uh, the person who struck him and jailed him, uh, this is verse six, as for you, Peshur, and as for all who dwell in your house, you shall go into captivity and come to Babylonia and there you shall die, you and all who love you, as you have prophesied lies to them, right? Because all the prophets, the other prophets are saying, it's all gonna be fine. You're gonna get out of this okay. And Jeremiah is the only one saying, no, death and destruction. Babylonia is going to come and destroy Jerusalem. But now we have this very personal plaintive cry from the prophet where we see what his own experience of bringing this message has feel, feels like for him. You enticed me, O Lord, and I was enticed. You were stronger than I, and you prevailed. I became a constant laughingstock all day long, all of them mocking me. For whenever I spoke, I screamed. Outrage and violence, I called. For the word of the Lord became to me disgrace and contempt all day long, and I thought, I will not recall them, nor will I speak any more in their name. But it was in my heart like burning fire shut up in my bones, and I could not hold it in. I was unable. Then later, I'm starting with verse 14. Curse of the day that I was born, the day my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Curse of the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, a male child is born to you, giving him great joy. And let that man be like the towns that the Lord overturned and did not relent. And let him hear screams in the morning and battle shouts at the hour of noon because he did not kill me in the womb, that my mother could be my grave and her womb pregnant for all time. Why from the womb did I come out to see wretchedness and sorrow and my days end in shame? This idea that as a prophet, he couldn't couldn't pray for the people and that he had to release the words that God said. They were like a fire shut up in his bones. It shows us the intense, intense suffering of the prophet. Um, and of course, I think that the focus and the window on Jeremiah's suffering is in some way its own rhetorical strategy to open up to us feeling for the suffering of the people as a whole and the destruction. Right? What must it look like to be in a place where you know that years of bad behavior have now accrued such consequences that you have to face them and you can deny them no longer and that pain and suffering are waiting for you. 
in some ways, I'm suggesting the book of Jeremiah shows us an example, at the very least, of how to get through, how to hold on to meaning and even to God in the midst of suffering. Yes, I see Joni as a hand up. Thank you. Um, thank you for your wonderful learning and uh, sharing the screen. So would, would you say then, what is the point of Jeremiah? Is it that we have a witness to something indisputable that happened rather than a catalyst? Because he can't articulate anything that will be helpful. Thank you. Yes, that is the question. And I'm going to be hopefully getting at that question in different ways today and tomorrow. On, on one sense, we're seeing that, um, that actually his, um, I would suggest that his framing of what's happening to the people is actually giving meaning to it and an ending to it. There is some consolation in Jeremiah, right? Even though he's not famous for it. I'll show you a bit in just a moment so that we're not all doom and gloom today, right? Um, but there is at the end building and planting, right? In, in his vision. And we're gonna see this more next time. That, that this is not all, this, this destruction is not all absurdity. Um, that, it, that it actually follows um, God's, um, God's word. And it's precisely in Jeremiah's theology and what he gets from God, that it's because the people have continued over and over to ignore God, that they have brought this disaster upon themselves. Yeah. Um, I'll, take, I'll take a couple more questions, then I'm going to try to look at a, a few different kinds of pieces. All there right. Are questions in the chat box, um, and a couple of people have their hands raised. OK. Um, so um, Rabbi Fire. And if I'm mispronouncing your name, please correct me. You should be able to unmute yourself, Rabbi Zev. There we are. There we are. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's fair, by the way. We're, we're Hungarian, not German. Uh, as, I, as I read Jeremiah's destruction and reconstruction, uh, I, I think of Kali, the, the Hindu goddess of destruction, for the purpose of, of building up, the destruction to provide space for the building up. Yes, and, and that's where we do see consolation, right? And it's just a matter of proportions for Jeremiah. You know, Isaiah, is almost all consolation, mm -hmm. right? But Jeremiah also has to bring to us the truth of the destruction, right? And, and many of us want to move right through the destruction, right into the, the new day, right? And yet, I think part of what we see with Jeremiah is maybe what you're saying too, is, is that you have to actually go through each step and the, the destruction and the catastrophe is part of, sadly, our relationship with God and the world. It is true. It happens. And in some ways, um, you know, this is, this is, um, I'll, I'll give you this quote that I love by Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel taught Jeremiah all the time, right? And he was, 
uh, famously, the New York Times wrote uh, an article about um, Elie Wiesel, blessed memory, teaching Jeremiah at Yale University, and there were 65 slots open, and over 350 students came, right? And this is in the 80s, right? In the early 80s. And he said that he, you know, he didn't know what to do, so he just told everyone who showed up to write down on a little index card, you know, why they want to take the class. When he went through, he just realized, you know, who was he to say who could stay or go? So he ended up teaching this class, you know, to, to all 350 people. And this is what he says about Jeremiah. I am fascinated by Jeremiah because he foresaw the tragedy. He lived the tragedy and he told the tra tragedy. He foresaw, lived, and told. Those are three different things that he did. He, like Moses, had a 40-year career as a prophet. But unlike Moses, he didn't get to take people out of slavery and into towards the new land, right? He had to do the opposite, right? He had to take them through catastrophe and destruction. So Wiesel said, and nobody listened, he was thrown in jail and was ridiculed, and he was ridiculed. Everything that could happen to a person happened to Jeremiah. They burned his book and he started writing it all over again. We'll see that next week. If I want to talk about today, I talk about Je Jeremiah, the somber beauty. And what I want to suggest is that the reason Jeremiah speaks to us even in a difficult way is because he does live and tell the tragedy. And for those of us, which is probably all of us who have experienced tragedy, right? It doesn't help to pretend that it doesn't exist, <clears throat> right? We see someone who walks through it. All right, Beth. Jeremiah does provide some consolation um, when Hashem tells him to let the people know that if they will accept the exile and go to Babylon, they will live. And it, it's if they stay put and try to fight that they will die. And so it's, it, it's um, first of all, it's God being merciful to these people that God intends to punish. And it is, it is giving uh, Yirmiyahu an opportunity to say something positive to the people, even though this isn't something they're going to want to do. Yes, and this is a continuing message throughout Jeremiah. Um, over and over, the people and the false prophets tell them, oh, just go to Egypt. Egypt is your savior. Oh, just have an alliance here. Do this. Stay, go, move. And it's Jeremiah who's saying, no, the Babylonians are coming. This is already happening, right? There's, um, there's for those of you who, who speak Hebrew, there's a wonderful satirical program called Hayehudim Ba'im, the Jews are coming um, in Israel. And they have, they have uh, a couple of different Jeremiah skits, right? And in one of them, everybody's in a bar and Jeremiah's trying to explain to them, you know, that the Babylonians are coming and nobody's listening to a word he says. You know what? They're, they're actually saying, um, they're actually saying, you know, like basically, thank God it's Friday, right? They're like focused on that moment until the Babylonians actually break through, right? Nobody wants to hear, you know, the bad news. And there are plenty of ways to distract oneself from it, right? But Beth's also right that Jeremiah is saying, look, this is going to happen, but it's not the end and it's not over. And so I'll make sure before we, um, before we get to the end of the hour, we see actually some of the beauty of Jeremiah as well. 
um, and the beauty of, of his prophecy. So I'm gonna share my screen again, and we're gonna look at a, a few little pieces. I'm gonna, first of all, just scroll way back to um, the beginning of chapter two. Um, the beginning of chapter two, where this is not a uh, chapter of consolation. Basically, it is the beginning of a, what is, was it in effect a prosecution of the people where uh, Jeremiah through God is building the case for why all of this is happening, right? And yet in the chapter, we have this beautiful verse. The word of the Lord came to me saying, go proclaim to Jerusalem, thus said the Lord, I accounted to your favor the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown, right? This is the beautiful Zacharti la chesed no'oraich, right? Um, this, this piece, we'll talk next time, I hope, a little bit about how Jeremiah shows up in our liturgy. And this is one place in Rosh Hashanah, um, Musaf, where, where we see, you know, it's also true. It's part of the tragedy that we're in a love story with God. I saw in the chat, somebody said, did the prophets know each other and talk to each other, right? There's a great skit in the Jews are coming with, uh, with Jeremiah and Ezekiel comparing notes. <laughs> um, but certainly Jeremiah is influenced here by um, the prophet Hosea, um, who, who really takes this uh, analogy as well of, of lovers of, of um, a married couple. And here, the love that was back in the old days, right? In our innocence, when we were intimate together in the wilderness, right? And there was no one else around and it was just us. And just in the next chapter, in chapter three, I didn't bring the verse, but since we're on you know, Rosh Hashanah Musaf, we also have the idea of God as the loving father who can't give up on a child, no matter what. Haben Yakirli Ephraim, right? You know, that, that Jeremiah knows that the reason this is so painful for the people, for, the, for God, for him, is because they are connected and they are in love in a love relationship. And it just makes the tragedy so much worse. But sometimes that love shines through, whether it's in a hopeful perspective or just in the experience of being with God, it's not all bad. So for example, in chapter 15, verse 16, your words were found and I ate them. Your words became to me a joy, the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord, God of armies, right? Jeremiah, as much as he struggles with God, also knows it's a tremendous honor and, and sometimes pleasure to be speaking the words of God. And finally, um, this is quoted as the source for why Jews started praying for governments in exile, right? Why we do a prayer for the government, right? Jeremiah says in chapter 29, thus said the Lord of armies, God of Israel, this is Robert Alter's uh, translation, by the way, to all the exiles whom I exiled to Babylonia, build houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat their fruit. There is life in Babylonia. There is life after this. Take wives, beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters to husbands. Let them bear sons and daughters and multiply there. Do not dwindle. Keep growing and seek the welfare of the city to which I exiled you and pray for it to the Lord. For through its shalom, you will have shalom. Even when the worst thing possible happens, even when Jerusalem is destroyed and we are exiled, 
Our covenant with God is not over. Our purpose in the world is not over. And we will continue. We will continue to find ways to build the world, to seek its welfare, to pray, and to find and create shalom. Okay, last comments or questions in our last two minutes? All right, so thank you for um, staying with me and Jeremiah, even when the going gets tough. Um, next time, we're going to be looking um, also at the medium of the message. And we're gonna see how Jeremiah might even be a bridge for us in some ways to the rabbis. Um, and we're also um, going to continue to take up this question, if you can't stop the destruction from happening, why are you prophesying? What is the point of the prophecy? We'll take all that up as we continue next week. Thank you again for your questions, comments, and presence. Lovely to learn Torah with all of you.